Hi, everyone. Hello. Thanks for coming in, taking a time out of your uh, afternoon and a beautiful afternoon and, uh, to come and hear us talk about what I do. Um, thanks to Holland Hospital for putting this on and connecting the uh, community to the physicians that serve the community. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, foot and ankle problems today. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, I am specializes in foot and ankle. Then we all have to do five years of orthopedic training first. And then we all specialize in these certain areas an extra year after that. So uh, uh, with either hip, shoulder, foot and ankle, uh, joint replacements, pediatrics, trauma, and tumor. Those are the top uh, categories in, in orthopedic surgery. Um, so I am new to the area. A little bit about me. Um, I grew up on the east side of the state uh, in the Farmington Hills area. Uh, I... Um, Went to school at the University of Michigan Dearborn, undergraduate studies. I did my microbiology degree. Then I went to uh, Wayne State University for medical school. Um, did four years there. And then I continued on at Wayne State University and did my orthopedic surgery residency. Uh, at, uh, I don't know if anybody's familiar with the Detroit Medical Center, Detroit Receiving Hospital up here, Sinai Grace, Harper, Children's Hospital of Michigan, all in downtown Detroit. Uh, after five years of orthopedic training, I did uh, one year of uh, foot and ankle fellowship, also at Wayne State, and stayed in the area. After I finished my training, I um, got a good offer out in Maine, Portland, Maine. Knew nothing about Portland, Maine. Took my wife and went out there and visited. We loved it. Uh, I don't know if anybody's been to Portland, Maine. A lot of people go to uh, Bar Harbor and they go to Acadia uh, up in uh, uh, north, uh, north uh, east of Maine. We loved it. My office was right here. This is the ocean. Uh, the airport was on the other side. You know, see patients all day. Oceans in front of you is beautiful. We have three young kids, my wife and I, and um, we had our third kid in Maine. Both we, we had the first two kids we had in Michigan, and then the, the third kid, we had a baby girl, we had her in Maine. And then no, no family support. Uh, is this too loud? I'll put it down. So we had no family support. My wife is home and got tired, so we eventually decided to come back home. Uh, my wife is from the west side of Michigan. Her family lives here in, uh, turn it down, right? Yeah. Uh, lives in uh, Grand Rapids. So we uh, came back and uh, met uh, uh, some of the guys that work here. And um, at Shoreline Orthopedics, uh, it's a group that's been around for a while. Uh, they have uh, all the specialties. They were like in the phone ankle, and I joined. So uh, this is where I practice at Shoreline Orthopedics. And I, uh, we cover both hospitals uh, in the community uh, for trauma reasons uh, and um, elective reasons. So it's a little bit about me. Um, so the reason we're here today is to talk about foot and ankle problems. Uh, the things I'm going to try to cover today are the most common things I see in the office. We can't cover everything. I left trauma out because trauma is its own bag, meaning ankle fractures, pelon fractures, foot fractures are all you know, trauma, especially here in the west side of Michigan, ice. We always slip in, lots of that. We see, but that's that's still be too much to cover in one hour. So we're going to talk about a little bit of uh, uh, you know a little bit about ten things that I pick that I see most often in the in the practice. So, so before we can start, we should probably just talk about a little bit of the anatomy, the foot and the ankle. So the foot, it's a unique structure. It has about 26 bones, 28 if you want to count the sesamoids, which live right underneath the big toe, right the big first metatarsal. We have also the same thing on the hand, two sesamoids here. Uh, the hind foot is the kind of the uh, motion, all the motion goes to the hind foot. So this is the ankle. The hind foot is what we call these two bones, the talus and calcaneus. The midfoot is a rigid structure, and the forefoot and the toes are moving. So as you all know, we walk on our feet, and then uh, uh, that, that foot has to propel us forward. There's lots of us from small to big, and the same foot has to propel us forward, and we have to be able to do single leg stand to be able to go next to the next step. Uh, muscles in the foot, they come from the leg. Most of the biggest muscle come from the leg and they go down to the foot. There's multiple ligaments, especially those three here where we sprain. You've heard of ankle sprain. Almost everybody had an ankle sprain. Those are the ligaments that we tear and nerves that come up from the top and, and go down. So uh, the foot is a unique structure. It has 107 ligaments, muscle tendons. It's all in the foot. So why is the foot so important? It's the gait. So the gait 
I'm sure you've seen people walk, you know your family members. If you don't even have to see them across the, across the room, but if you see them walk, you can tell who that person is or not. So if your husband or wife are walking down, you can look at them and, oh, that's the way my husband works. That's the way I mean, walks. That's the way my wife walks. So it's a learned behavior. We don't walk. We're not born learning how to walk. As you know, the kids, they can't walk, so they, that's a learned behavior. Um, the big part of the uh, gait cycle is the Achilles tendon. So the Achilles tendon that lives right in the back here, which is kind of a if you haven't learned anything today, you're going to learn about the Achilles tendon because it's, it's the cause of not most of the, the, the things I listed before. So we'll talk about it in more detail. So the Achilles tendon is in the back uh, right here. So this is kind of the phase of the cycle. We heel strike when we first land. We go to flat foot, early flat foot, late flat foot, and we toe off. So when you're towing off, that Achilles tendon has to generate the force to propel you forward to the next step because at one point you're going to be single leg, st leg, leg, I'm sorry, single limb stand and you're going to push yourself forward. So it has to generate all that power. So as Newton's laws, we've heard about three Newton's laws, so every force has an equal, equal and opposite reaction. So the, the force that you're going to generate right here, the ground is going to push up against your foot. The ground is stronger than everybody, you and I, and it's, going to, it's not going to move. So something has to move. It's either your ankle, which has to move, it has to dorsal flex at least 10 degrees, come up 10 degrees to clear you so you can clear the ground. You've heard of people that have foot drops, they can't clear the ground. So what happens is they trip on their own feet and they drag them. So we give them AFOs or, or uh, uh, braces to keep their foot at 90 degrees so they can clear the ground. Because you need that 10 degrees of the ankle motion to go up in order for you to clear the ground. Achilles is a pretty broad insertion. It's, it's a big muscle right here. It inserts in the back of the heel. So, I'm sure you can't turn on the TV and not see a foot, you know, foot commercial or, or a Dr. Scholl gelling. You're gelling, you're not gelling. Custom orthotics, you go to the Walgreens, you put your feet down. It's a, it's a multi-million dollar industry. Now they even have them for high heels, because we know how women love their high heels, and that's kind of what keeps me in business. A lot of the time is we're loving their high heels. So, Heidi Klum is advertising high heels, dream walk for the high heel shoes. So go back, so now back to the Achilles tendon. So we're going to talk about a little bit of the, the disorders that occur with the Achilles tendon. So the Achilles tendon is made up of two muscles, one called the soleus, which lives right back here, and one called the gastrocnemius, which is, starts above the knee, crosses the knee, meets up with the soleus. They both get together and make the Achilles tendon. They cross the ankle joint and they insert on the heel. So again, that's the force that needs to be generated by the Achilles tendon to propel us forward. So this pulls up that way. What happens to the foot? It pulls down, the ground pushes up, and we propel ourselves forward. So have you heard the term, this is his Achilles heel or her Achilles heel? Does anybody know where that term comes from? It's a Greek, Greek term. That's the Achilles. The Achilles tendon gets its name from the Greek warrior Achilles, where his mother uh, dipped him in a river of sticks by his heel, and then he eventually got wounded. He was, he was good everywhere except his heel cord, and he got uh, killed by an arrow from the uh, Prince Paris that shot him right in the Achilles and killed him. That's where the name come from. Contracts with about 10, degree, 10 times body weight, especially when you're running. Imagine of the, all, the, all the power it has to generate. So, so the Achilles, uh, is, it's a, tendon, a straight tendon. It has no sheath on it, meaning the blood supply has to come from most tendons that we have in our body have sheath around them. That's where they get their supply, the, the vascular supply from. The Achilles does not have that, so it has to get the supply elsewhere. So it gets it from the muscle above and from the heel, uh, the heel bone below. On top of that, when these two muscles meet and they come down to form the Achilles tendon, it twists. So it twists 90 degrees, so it makes it even tighter on those vascular supply, and it lands into the back of the heel. Uh, there's a zone, we call a zone of avascularity, it's two to six centimeters proximal. This is where most of the stuff we see where the problems occur. So Achilles tendinosis, that's something I see all the time. The, uh, some of the common causes of Achilles tendinosis are tight Achilles, tight Achilles, tight Achilles. That's, that's the number one cause. Again, I showed you where the tendon insert, where the tendons uh, come from. It comes from two muscles, one that goes above the knee. As human beings, we sit down a lot, so our knees are bent. We spend six to eight hours a night sleeping. 
Most of us sleep with our feet down, so that tendon gets tight. So you go in the morning to get up, and the first step you take, that tendon has to stretch back out. Overuse syndromes, people that like to run, like to run all, you know, some people come in the office and say, I run 30 miles a week. You know, sometimes I don't drive 30 miles a week, so, so that's, a, that's a lot of running. So it's a, and, and they do it, you know, we have winner, winner, winner. Now the sun is out, so you can see tons of people out running, running. So overuse syndrome, postural problem like high arch, low arch, but surface related injuries like running on, running on uh, hills, uh, training errors, poor, you know, poor footwear, trying to put this, you know, foot in the shoe, sometimes that does not go as well, but it looks good and they want to do it. Aging is part of it as well because of the blood supply. And then other things like inflammatory arthropathy, like rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis can cause that. So what are the symptoms? Uh, 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 the classification, some, uh, what, what you can have is you can have Achilles tendon problem in the tendon itself or peritendon problem like a bursa in the front or in the back. You can have both peritendinitis and Achilles tendinosis. Uh, there's two kinds of Achilles tendinosis. You can have insertional and non-insertional. Insertional meaning at its insertion in the bone or in that two to six centimeter uh, avascular area we talked about earlier. That's called non-insertional Achilles tendinosis. And the trauma is Achilles uh, tendon tears. Um, and this is just to show a little bit of an example of what you would see in the back of the heel. This is called the Hagland deformity. The, it's also known as a pump bump, uh, usually because of uh, poor shoe wear. <coughs> <coughs> so the Hag <coughs> Hagland versus the spur, you, you, again, if the Achilles is tight, so when it's going to propel us forward uh, and the forces generated on the, fore on the forefoot is high, the tendon pulls pieces of bone off the back of the heel, which causes this, this spur right here. So this is a large spur. And that, where does that spur live? That's, that spur lives right in this tendon. So there's not much room back here. If you put your hand on the back of your heel, there's not much skin back there. The tendon is right there. There's maybe a centimeter to centimeter and a half of skin. Uh, so that spur, so this is the end of the heel right here. And this is within the substance of the tendon. So it lives within the tendon. So if you have a spur that big that lives in the tendon, you have to have a tear in the tendon. Although it's not a full tear, it's a micro tear or a macro tear in this incident. Uh, but, but there's a tear in the tendon because that spur is occupying that space where the tendon is. Um, the Hagelin deformity, the pump up, is just an um, enlargement of the back of the heel it's supposed to usually go down straight. When it goes up and down, that's a Hagelin. So this is somebody who has a Hagelin deformity and an insertional uh, spur of the Achilles. So he, he or she definitely has a tight Achilles tendon. If you have any questions, you can st stop me. We can try to answer some of the questions. If we're running out of time, we'll keep them to the end. But if we can just continue doing questions while we talk, we can do that. So. So uh, the Achilles tendinosis is a degenerative process. It, uh, it takes years of, uh, of uh, use and uh, overuse. Uh, it's, it's not, uh, the tendon is avascular, it doesn't have a good blood supply. So when we go in to look at it, it's yellow. It's not inflammatory. There's not a lot of inflammation going on. It's actually degenerative. Uh, there's soft tendon, there's micro and macro tear. Again, this is not a tear that's gonna stop you from walking. Those are little tears within the tendon. Eventually at one point, if you snapped or you did the wrong move, uh, you can have a, a, a tendon tear, a complete tendon tear, which you will know about. A micro tear you might not know about. It might hurt a little bit and then goes away on its own. A, 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 a complete tear you're, you're going to know about. You're not going to walk. So uh, what do people complain of? They complain of uh, pain in the back of the heel, uh, either at the insertion or in the mid-substance. Sometimes they have a lump. Sometimes they don't. If it's early on, they're not going to have a bump. Uh, but uh, you push on that tendon and they scream. They tell you exactly when they feel it in the morning when they first get up. Again, because we sleep with our feet down. They get up, they, they put that foot down, and they take that step. They got to hit the ankle at 90 degrees to, to walk, and they feel it. Uh, after they take a few steps, they feel it loosens up, and they do okay. And uh, usually they do okay throughout the day. They may be taking a Motrin or two during the day. And then at the end of the night, when they sit down to watch a movie or watch the news for half an hour, it comes back when they try to get up. Again, because we sit, the knees bent, feet down, or plant our flex or down, um, they feel it. 
and then it comes back at night. So um, that's the Achilles tendinosis. So bursitis could be uh, around the tendon, like I showed before. It's the, the, there's two, two bursas. A bursa is a sac of fluid between a tendon and a bone to allow the mobilization of the tendon. We have them in the elbow. We have them on the side, trochanteric bursitis. It's where the, the bone and tendons meet, where there's not a lot of fat or soft tissue. It creates a bursa. So you can get a bursa uh, inflammation in front of the Achilles or behind the Achilles. Again, there's not much room behind the Achilles. The skin is right there. So if you get a, a, um, a calcaneal bursitis, you're going to know it. You're going to know it right away because the shoe is going to hit on it right away. So, um, uh, and, uh, so what do we do for this? So the initial treatment is an anti-inflammatory medication because this is, the bursa is an inflammatory process. So we try anti-inflammatory medication. We try steroids either by mouth or we try steroids injections. Um, uh, modification of shoe wear is always one of the top things I teach. And if the pain is bad enough, we immobilize you. We give you a boot, a removable cast that keeps the ankle at 90 degrees. So you can still walk, but you don't, bend, you don't bend the ankle. So if you don't bend the ankle, the Achilles is not working, which is rest. So if the, if the uh, ankle is not moving, the Achilles is not moving. So you can walk like a peg leg, I call it. Just walk with the boot. So, uh, and stretching. So I teach stretching at least 50 to 60% of my patients a day. I have a program I teach. Uh, the most important things, I'm sure most of you have stretched before, gone to the gym, done sports activities. The most important thing is you got to keep the knee straight. Because remember, the anatomy I always talked about earlier in the, in the talk is the Achilles is made up of two muscles, one of which crosses the knee. So if the, knee's, if the knee is bent, you're not stretching the Achilles. You're stretching the soleus muscle, which is part of the Achilles. But you're not stretching the Achilles, which is made up of two muscles. So you got to keep it straight. Most of these cases are treated non-surgical. They usually come back. Tendinitis, people have had it in the shoulder. They know they get an injection, it comes back. Keep, you know, comes back if, if they go back to the same um, uh, work they did before, the same exercise they did before. So um, uh, uh, if, uh, what tells us if this is going to be treated good with, uh, I'm sorry, treated successfully with non-surgical measures, the length of, of symptoms. If you come in and tell me I've had these symptoms for two years, they're not going away, yeah, probably more than, more than likely you're not going to be able to uh, uh, resolve this with non-surgical treatment. We might have to talk about surgical treatment. So the length of, the, the length of symptoms, if, say, less than six months, we, more, more than likely we can treat you non-surgical. But again, this is a ballpark. There's always exceptions. So I always try, try non-operative treatment. I rarely operate on the first time I see somebody. Always try non-surgical treatment. Stretching, rest, boot, immobilization, boot, heel lift. So heel lift, something we use, I don't like to use it a lot because it makes the tendon tighter. Because imagine, I'm giving you something to put in the back of your heel to lift you up, shortening that distance in the back so it's going to be tighter. But if you come in, you're miserable, you're in a lot of pain, you have somewhere to go, you have a vacation coming up, we try it for a short period of time, a heel lift. And if you have a flat foot, we sometimes give you an arch support. And steroid injection. I don't like to inject the tendon because you do have an increased risk of rupture with injection, injection of the tendon. So surgical, what kind of stuff can we do surgical? The, the, um, we can do tendon lengthening, tendon debridement, uh, resection of the hagland and or the spur if that's where your pain is, and or tendon transfer. The tendon lengthening is the most common thing I do. It's a small surgery, it takes about 10 minutes to do. The recovery is minimal. You wear a boot for two weeks and uh, no crutches needed. You're walking on it. You just wear, because what I did, I lengthen the tendon. I come up here in the middle of the leg. Away from where the tendon is, we make a small incision, we open it, we find the, the tendon muscle junction and we lengthen it. So when we lengthen it, we put it in 90 degrees. So I wanna keep it at 90 degrees for two weeks straight because I don't want you to go home and sleep and putting that foot down it's going to come back in the back and it's going to uh, tighten again. So two weeks in the boot and then we're done. It works in about 90% of the people. It doesn't work in everybody. Again, we do this for a problem down in the Achilles, in the heel. But where we come up, we come up above the heel. We come up 20 centimeters above the heel and lengthen the tendon. The premise is if we lengthen the tendon, we take the uh, stress off the heel or the mid-substance here and he help it heal. That's the premise behind that surgery. Tendon debridement. If I showed you that uh, um, 
I showed you that spur be, uh, before. If you have a spur that big, again, that's living in the tendon, I have to get that tendon off the bone in order for me to get that uh, spur out. I can't just go in and remove that spur. It's not accessible. I have to remove the tendon off the bone, cut that tendon out, I'm sorry, cut that spur out, and then put the tendon back onto the heel, which, which makes it a bigger surgery, about six to eight weeks in a cast. Um, uh, tendon transfer is if, if the tendon is degenerated and the tendon is, is, is not strong enough to be sewn together, what I usually do is I borrow a muscle from the big toe flexor and I swing it over to help the Achilles heel. I bring it over here and I drill, I drill a hole in the, in the heel bone and I bring that tendon forward to it, kind of sandwich it with the Achilles tendon to bring the blood supply. Again, any picture or all the pictures you'll see today, white. The Achilles tendon from about 15 centimeters down is white. White means no blood supply. So when I bring a red muscle, which lives right here, it goes to the big toe flexor and I, and I wrap around. Most people don't miss it. I've had a couple of people miss it. Uh, the people that like to do rock climbing. A lot of rock, climbings, like, uh, rock climbers like to put their toes and grip on these rocks to, to be able to climb and dancers. Dancers that go on their tiptoes a lot and do a lot of these uh, uh, maneuvers. They, they don't like it. Um, <clears throat> So again, this is, this is what I was talking about is the red muscle that sits right in front of the Achilles. The Achilles is back here. This is the flexor halsus longus or the big toe flexor. It's all red. You see how they're all red? So imagine all that blood supply that I take it over and I swing it and I connect it to the Achilles. Again, to get to the Haglund deformity, I have to remove that tendon off the bone in order for me to get to that Haglund or that spur, which makes it a little bigger. So your heel goes from looking like this in the back so now the tendon, instead of sitting the tendon up here with the spur in it, now we gave you another centimeter to two centimeters of room to put that tendon uh, in the back of the heel and take that pain away. So those are the, some of the surgical procedures we do for Achilles tendinosis. So you've heard of Achilles tendon rupture. You've heard of the weekend warrior. I've done it. Fourth of July, I'm not in great shape. I don't run all the time. Uh, Fourth of July, people come over. We have a couple of beers. The basketball hoop is up. We want to play, and then you want to try to dunk on somebody or, you know, do what you did 20 years before, and then you feel that snap in the back of your heel and pop, the Achilles tendon goes. And that's, again, it's years of degeneration. It didn't happen over from one. Uh, it's years of degeneration. I'm sure you've, you know this uh, person, is Kobe Bryant, plays for the Lakers, world-class athlete. I don't know if you've seen the picture where he tore his Achilles tendon. He was pretty much just walking up. He turned, and his, his tendon went. And this is a world-class athlete, so I'm definitely not in that category. So most of the time we see it as people that play in tennis, um, lunging for a shot to get it, tripping on a curb, jumping from height. Usually it's between 40, between 39, late 30s and early 50s is where you see this, uh, and it's five to one male dominance, mostly in male. We see it. So when you have this, then you can't walk. So you're going to know when you tore your Achilles tendon. So what do we do for that? Again, initial treatment, we, in the US, we fix all these. If somebody can have surgery in between 30s and 50s, we fix all these. The only people that we don't fix is usually the diabetic who are too sick to have surgery. We usually don't fix this. In Europe, they treat all of theirs non-operatively. So this is kind of a difference between the US medicine and, and the Europeans. Um, we know, we know for one, uh, one thing for sure is if you treat it non-operatively, you have a higher re-rate of, re, a higher, I'm sorry, it has a higher rate of re-rupture. So uh, it's about three to 4% higher uh, re-rupture rate than if we do fix it. So we treat you in a plantar flexion, meaning we put you in a, in a boot that is down. So, so what we do is, the reason for that is, we, the tendon is torn back here, we put you like this, so we allow the two um, opposing end to get closer to each other and heal. And over six to eight weeks, we take you from this position to a normal 90 degree position. Uh, it, most of the times, like I said here, we do fix them unless there's a reason not to fix them. And we go in and, and suture them up. There are studies that show uh, somebody over the age of 40, a tendon transfer, uh, they, do, they do better. Meaning if we bring that red muscle, attach it with uh, repairing the tendon, it's usually better. Because when I go in, and this is a true case, this is what I see. So these are shreds, <coughs> shreds. So you, you can't sew that. 
any stitch you put in there, it's hard, you know, because we got to sew this way. This is the top of the body, and this is the heel. This is the front of the body. This is the back of the, uh, the leg. So we suture this way. This is where the alignment of the Achilles is, and every stitch you put. So you have to clean all this and get your bite, we call it a bite, in the, in the, in the tendon from back here. So I have to put you at 90 degrees, at least more than 90 degrees down in order to get those two tendon ends to oppose. But if I bring a muscle which sits right in this area here, right there, and I wrap it like a burrito, right, right around that tendon, white tendon, they usually do well. I put it, in a, again, in a, in, a, in a hole down by the, by the heel bone, and, and, I, and I still repair the Achilles tendon, but, but I, you, the difference is you leave the operating room with the surgery at 90 degrees. If I only do a suture, you leave the operating room with a, a 40 to 50 degrees of plantar flexion down, which is going to bring you back up over six to eight weeks. So we're going to move on to uh, plantar heel pain. So that's another thing I see all the time. So Achilles is in the back, plantar heel pain is in the bottom. So the couple of things we see, plantar fasciitis, I'm sure most of you heard of it, or know somebody that had it. Sharp pain in the back of the, in the bottom of the heel. Usually they point right where the, the plantar aspect of the heel. Uh, um, worse in the morning, gets better after a few steps. Worse when you get sit down to watch a movie, get up. Again, the same reasons I've described for the Achilles tendon. Um, some of the uh, things we call differential diagnosis is stress fracture. Somebody who runs 30 miles a week, they can have a stress fracture of the calcaneus. That could also give you plantar heel pain. Infections, mostly in diabetics. Plantar fibromatosis is an extension of uh, plantar fasciitis. It's a, it's a cousin of the putrin. People have seen in the hand, they have the putrin contracture where the hand goes down. We have the same plantar, not plantar fascia, but palmar fascia, we call it in the hand. Um, flexor halsis tendonitis in dancers, I see that a lot. That's the tendon I borrow, it goes right here. And uh, they can um, cause uh, uh, heel pain. And tarsal tunnel syndrome, carpal tunnel is his cousin in the hand. We'll talk about it in a little bit. So what is the plantar fascia? The plantar fascia is an anatomical structure. It's in the, in the bottom of the foot. This is our weight coming down. This is the foot with the arch. And it's like a truss at the bottom of the foot. It allows the foot to be rigid in order for us to propel forward. It's an inelastic structure. It does not have a lot of give. It attaches at the bottom of the heel, right there, right there. Uh, and it goes all the way to the toes. So when we walk, you dorsal flex or bring the toes up. It makes the structure tight. Gives us more of a force to propel us forward. Besides the Achilles tendon, uh, the force of the Achilles tendon. Um, it's an inelastic structure. It has a high tensile force, and it attaches on the heel uh, tuberosity. I get tons of questions about this heel spur right here. A lot of people, oh, it's the heel spur that's causing my pain. It's not the heel spur that's causing the pain. It's a, the heel spur is a byproduct of the plantar fasciitis. Just like the Achilles tendonitis pulls bone in the back of the heel and gives you that spur, the plantar fascia does the same thing. It pulls bone off the heel with years of pulling, and it causes that spur. I don't go after that spur. That spur is in the bottom of the heel. It's um, embedded in muscle and tissue, and you have to tear the foot apart to get that spur out. We treat the cause. Treat the plantar fascia. The spur can live there forever. Unlike the back of the heel, you only have a centimeter to two. The bottom of the foot, you have at least an inch, an inch and a half of fat and, uh, 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 fat and soft tissue. So you will not feel a uh, 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 spur uh, in, the bottom, in the bottom of the foot. So uh, this is another picture of sleeping. This is how we sleep, knees bent, plantar flex. So uh, uh, pain in the bottom of the heel, gradual onset, worse in the morning, after prolonged rest, returns at the, the, at the end of the day. And most of the time, it's unilateral, one side. You come in complaining of bilateral uh, plantar fasciitis, uh, it could happen, but I got to think harder to see if anything else is going on. Uh, you do have rheumatoid. People with rheumatoid get bilateral. People with diabetes get bilateral. If you're a healthy man with two-sided uh, plantar fasciitis, it could happen, but it makes me think harder and look for other causes. Again, the treatment, it's self-limited, stretching, stretching, and stretching. So if you don't learn anything in this lecture, Stretch that Achilles tendon. It'll cause you a lot. It'll, it'll save you a lot of foot and ankle headaches or pain. So, night and again, keep that knee straight. Uh, uh, night splints. So I give them night splints to sleep at night. They're not the most comfortable thing. I have tried one. I couldn't sleep in it, but 
better than surgery. That's something we try. Uh, physical therapy where they can put steroids and they can do iontophoresis and inject that steroids in, uh, in the heel uh, uh, is another. another. Um, extracorporeal shockwave therapy is a therapy that is approved. It's, um, uh, it's, a, it's a therapy where you inject, I'm sorry, not inject, uh, do shocks in the bottom of the heel and it allows the blood supply, it, it stimulates the blood supply. So it creates a little, a little hyperemia we call or, or it increases the blood supply. It's not covered by insurance. It's only cash basis. I don't think anybody offers it here. The only place I know in, in, in West Michigan is in Kentwood. I don't know if anybody in Holland's offering that. So, an injection. I will do one injection. I will give one injection again, risk of rupture. Uh, I don't do one more than once. Treatment, surgical treatment, similar to the Achilles tendonitis. The cause is the same. We come up high and I treat that cause. Tight Achilles, I loosen it up high. Two weeks in a boot. If that fails, second step is to come down in the heel and uh, release the plantar fascia in the heel. I don't go after the bone spur. I just release the plantar fascia. There's two sides of the plantar fascia, medial and lateral. You, know, you can take one, you can't take both, otherwise the foot will go flat. But the reason I start up high is because incisions on the bottom of the foot are not fun. People don't like them. You gotta be on weight bearing, you gotta be on crutches until the skin heals, usually three, two to three weeks. So I don't like to put incisions at the bottom of the foot if I can help it. Tarsal tunnel, so that's the cousin of a carpal tunnel. Same thing we have in the foot. It's on the inside here. Um, there's a, a flexor inoculum, same thing that we have in the hand. It covers the bone, and it goes from the heel bone to the medial malleolus, or the inside bone here. Um, it, um, it has tendons, muscles, I'm sorry, it has uh, tendons, uh, nerves, and uh, arteries uh, that goes in the tunnel. So anything that would cause uh, uh, this tunnel to be crowded, i.e. I, like uh, uh, inflammatory uh, 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 cyst, if there's a ganglion cyst in the tunnel, so that's extra. There, there's, not, there's only enough room in the tunnel for these things. Anything extra will cause uh, the tunnel to be crowded and it will cause uh, pain. Um, again, you have three muscles, tibial artery, tibial nerve, and, and um, um, the flexor inoculum. So what do people complain of? Uh, some of the causes of, uh, of this I, I just talked about is, is um, ganglion cysts, obesity. Flat foot is a big cause of this is because when the foot goes flat, you lose the arch. What happens to the foot is you increase the tension on this area. So arch makes this loose as you see it here. And then when you lose the, when you lose the um, uh, arch, the, the, fl the flat foot causes increased tension. Because what happens with flat foot, and I'll talk about that in a little bit uh, later, is this is the arch, you lose it. The foot swings out this way. So it pulls, gives you more pressure on the inside of the ankle. So what do people complain of? Um, unlike plantar fasciitis where they come and tell you, this is where it hurts, in the bottom of the foot. This, uh, they, they come and say it hurts all around the inside of the foot. I, I can't tell you exactly where, but all the inside of the foot. It, and you go to examine them and you push, they're really not that tender. Uh, you can't find a spot that, Boom, you know, this is the, the, like the plantar fascia. You find a spot and they jump. Here, not likely. They, they just tell you shooting. They use the word electricity, shooting pain, um, aggravate with activity. It's better with rest. Um, and then some people talk about when going at night. They feel the throbbing at night uh, uh, pain. So it's a, but they use these terms, electric, searing, burning, shooting. That alerts me that it's more of a nerve issue versus a bone issue. Arthritis, sure, a lot of you guys have if, you know, arthritic pain. It's not, it's not searing. It's not burning. It's more of an aching uh, pain versus, versus the nerve pain that you get with the carpal tunnel and the tarsal tunnel. Um, <clears throat> so what do we do for that? Again, I, most of the time I do conservative treatment, treat the cause. So if, but if there's a cyst in the tunnel, then you can't treat that conservatively. That's, that's a structural thing. It's too many, too many structure in the tunnel. One of them has to leave in order for that, for that pressure to come off the nerve. So we, if that's the only one that we have to operate on right away. Um, so if you have flat foot, we give you inserts to elevate the arch to allow that uh, tension on the inside of the ankle to stop. Um, we can try anti-inflammatory medication to reduce the inflammation. Sometimes the tendonitis can cause it. Tendon inflammation can cause crowding. 
uh, injections. You can inject the nerve, obviously. We don't inject the nerve. We inject around the nerve to bring down the inflammation. Uh, or we can use some medication, uh, nerve medications. You hear about Cymbalta, Lyrica, Gabapentin. Those are all conservative treatment. If you fail three to six months of treatment, we can uh, release the uh, uh, tarsal tunnel like we do the carpal tunnel, small incision. Unlike the carpal tunnel, in the tarsal tunnel, you have to be on crutches for a couple of weeks just to let the skin heal. Um, uh, in carpal tunnel, surgery is, is quick, in and out. It's usually very, uh, uh, you move right away. So uh, that's, that's the uh, decompression would be the cause. Just all we do is cut the tendon, cut the, uh, sorry, cut the flexor sheet. So open up the tunnel. Great question. The question was, do you order a nerve conduction study, like an EMG? Have any of you guys had an EMG? It's not a fun test. They, they sit and stick you with needles, and they got to send electricity down, down the needles and measure. I, if I have a clinical indication, and you're telling me the right word, it's searing, it's burning, and it's around the inside of the ankle, from the experience I've had is I usually do not. Right? And if I eliminate all the other causes around, and I think this is tarsal tunnel, I do not get an EMG. It's not a comfortable test. People don't like it, um, and I usually do not. Yeah. Next, on the same um, line as nerve uh, pain is the Morton's neuroma. I'm sure you've heard of the Morton's neuroma. What is the Morton's neuroma? We have nerves that go from the top of the leg down into the foot. There's uh, two nerves, one called the medial plantar nerve, one called the lateral. This is the medial plantar nerve, lateral plantar nerve. In the third web space, meaning between the third and the fourth toes, there's a communication between the lateral and the medial plantar nerve right here. Makes the nerve a little thick. All these nerves have to go through or under the flexor retinaculum right there. This is a, it's a flexor uh, ligament that attaches all the metatarsal head. We have it in the hand too. Right? And it attaches all of that, so it makes them stable. They don't move that much. So they have to go under, and it goes to the toe. So um, the Morton's neuroma is the thickening of that nerve and entrapment underneath the, underneath the flexor ligament uh, between the third and the fourth toe. That is the most common. It's not the only place that it occurs, but 90% of the time, that's what it is in the third web space. Causes. For this one, the women have us on that one. It's four to one women to men ratio. Age around 29, 81. It's usually 50s. Uh, bilateral in about 15% 50, uh, of the time. Uh, idiopathic, we, sometimes we don't know the cause, but uh, shoes do contribute. Trauma, any fractures that create hematoma, create bleeding, create calluses, uh, or a lesion uh, in the nerve itself that can cause it. Anything that makes the nerve bigger than it, usually, it, that it is uh, um, causes that. So. Symptoms, pain is localized to the plantar foot. In this, they tell you it's between uh, uh, third and fourth toe, they're more specific. Uh, again, they use the term burning, tingling, electric, more nerve than it is muscle or, or uh, joints. Uh, radiates to the toes. They feel something moving around, and it does move around because it's, it's, the, it's the nerve between the toes, and every time you flex the toes, that's going in and out between that ligament. That's what causes the pain. That's how I diagnose it. I grab, what I do on the exam is I, I put my finger underneath the heads of the metatarsal between three and four, and I squeeze in and out like this. Kind of get the nerve in and out, and I can feel a click. We call that a Mulder's click. You can feel the nerve go click, click, click. It's not very, com it's not very, it's painful, but, but that's how we diagnose it. So, and it gets caught and results in sharp pain. Again, it gets caught between the flexor anaculum and the bone, and it causes pain. So what do we, what do we do? We tell you to wear wider shoes. If you're wearing this shoe, you know, I mean, just it's a, matter, it's a matter of space. You can't fit all five toes in this uh, toe box. So we tell you to get wider, uh, wider shoes, low heel to take the tension off the Achilles. Again, remember the Achilles pulls that way. The forefoot is what you toe off with. That's where all the pressure is. Um, metatarsal pads, we put metatarsal pads underneath the metatarsal head to elevate the metatarsal head to give more room for the nerve. The nerve is under the metatarsal head. Injection, I usually can do one or two injections here. There's no risk of rupture of the plantar fascia or the Achilles, as I said before. Um, Anti-inflammatories to decrease the inflammation. And then decompression, excision. 
So there's a difference what we do. There's two things we can do. We can decompress it like we did in the tarsal tunnel. So go in and just cut the flexor and acum. So give it more room. Let that nerve go up and down so it doesn't get caught anymore. However, if I go in and I find the nerve to be this size uh, and large, the decompression enough is the decompression alone is not enough. We have to remove. I do remove the the nerve. So if you remove the nerves, what happens? You get numbness in that area. So that's something that we tell the patient that if I end up removing the nerve, you're going to be numb in that area. But numbness is better than pain. If you're in a lot of pain and you can't take it, sometimes we do remove the nerve and give you the area of numbness, and that helps. <clears throat> and they do come back because the nerve comes all the way from the back of the leg all the way down, so they regenerate. So you can have another neuroma. The bunion. I'm sure we all have heard about the bunion. Any questions so far? So the bunion, where does it get its name? From the Latin word turnip. Any enlargement or deformity of the great toe, anything that makes this area bigger, People call it a bunion. There's other things that can cause enlargement in an area besides the bunion, and I'll describe what a bunion is. Uh, but you've heard of gout, people gouty arthritis, bursa, again, cyst, ganglion cyst of the tendon, arthritis can cause a bump, hallux rigidus or arthritis of the big toe. Its cousin is the basal hand uh, arthritis. A lot of people get arthritis in the basal um, thumb. So what is a bunion? The, the medical term is hallux valgus. Hallux is big toe. Valgus is directional. So this way is varus. This way is valgus. Anything away from the body, the center of the body, we call valgus. And so anything towards the middle or the axis of the body, we call varus towards. So hallux valgus. So this, the metatarsal, goes medial this way. And the toe, because there's ligaments and muscles attached there, creates an uh, imbalance of pull of the muscles. So the muscles that were pulling straight, if you move this axis this way, now the muscle is going to be pulling in. So if you move this this way, then the muscle is going to be pulling that way now. And it gets that toe moving that way. So that's what, uh, the, what a hallux, uh, what a bunion is. It's a sublux joint. It's a deviated bone, and it's a displaced toe. It also has a little bit of rotational component. If you've seen a grandma or somebody who's got a severe bunion, the toe is rotated as well, not just turned, it's rotated <clears throat> because of the muscle imbalance. We have all these fancy angles that we measure um, to kind of, the only reason we do it is to classify this as a mild, moderate, or severe bunion. Um, uh, we measure the angle between the toe and the metatarsal and the angle between the first and second metatarsal. So those are the two angles we measure, and based on that, we classify if this is a mild, uh, moderate, or severe bunion, and that's how we treat. There's different uh, procedures we use for mild, different procedures for moderate, and different procedure for severe bunion. Uh, the uh, inner metatarsal angle, the angle between 1 and 2, normally should be less than 10 degrees. 50% uh, of these occur early in life, uh, uh, around 20 years uh, of age. That's different than an adolescent bunion. There's an adolescent bunion that you have before you maturely, maturely uh, uh, you finish growing, before, before you reach maturity. So be, when the physes are open, the growth plates are open, that's different. Um, female to ra uh, male ratio, again, this is uh, more uh, seen in uh, female than it is for uh, male. We do say maybe the shoes are the... Reason, however, um, that's, not all, th that's not all the story because we have to have two components. You have to have an internal and external component. There has to be some kind of family uh, a genetic uh, component in it, somebody in your family, mother, aunts, uncles, uh, that had this. So in my practice, 90% of the bunions I see are in female. So two causes, extrinsic and intrinsic. Again, just a matter of space. You're going to put this foot into this space, it's gonna push that way over years, that will cause the muscle imbalance, but again, it's not the only thing because we don't see it in, in the Japanese population. We don't see it because they wear the sandals, uh, 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 the footwear is different, so. It is, it is, it definitely contributes, that's an environmental factor, but you do have to have the genetic component uh, um, with it. But not everybody that wears high heels and tight shoes gets bunions, so that's, that's another why. Um, again, positive history in, in uh, 58 to 88% of the people. 
Flat feet can contribute to it, uh, again, because you lose the arch, the foot has to turn in. Hypermobility of the joints, this is a hypermobile first ray. One and two have to work together in order to propel us forward. So if one goes up when you hit the ground, all the way it's going to go on two, and that's going to contribute to having a bunion, as well as to a hammer toe, which I'm not covering today, but two, the second joint is not meant to carry the weight all by itself. So if one is not helping, two gets uh, overloaded and you get uh, synovitis of the joint or inflammation of the joint and you get a hammer toe. So even though you come in the office talking about a hammer toe, if you have a hypermobile first ray, if I fix the hammer toe and not touch the bunion or the hypermobile first ray, it's going to come back. So if we just fix the uh, hammer toe alone and we, we leave the hypermobility, the cause of the hammer toe, then it's going to come back. And that's uh, ligamentous laxity is part of it as well. So what do they complain of? Pain over the uh, first uh, MTP joint on the inside. Obviously, it rubs on shoes, it swells, they get uh, uh, blisters, irritation with the shoes, fatigue, can't walk for a long period of time. Again, remember, Im muscle imbalance, so the muscles are not all working correctly, so you get fatigue. Difficulty walking long distances. What do we do? Shoe modification. Get bigger shoes, so wider toe box. Achilles tendon stretch, uh, stretching because that's in the back, that's what increases the force on the front. Soft leather shoes, uh, stretching of the shoes, we send you to uh, 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 somewhere where they can stretch your shoes. Here in town, I think I met a guy named Lockers. Lockers, he's in, down here in Holland, he does some of this. Orthotics, uh, some, and there's many splints. You, you can Google bunion and you'll get tons of remedies on the internet. Uh, some that tape the, the bunion, some that uh, splint the bunion. Uh, socks that hold the bunion in one way or another. It's, again, it's a big industry. Uh, so a splint that keeps the bunion this way, it is not going to fix the bunion. Might help with the symptoms, but it's not going to fix the bunion. The, the bunion is a structural deformity. So it's the bone that moved. So this is not going to put it back. Only thing that's going to put it back is surgical uh, correction. That's going to make it go away. Uh, but the people wear this on the side of the foot to prevent it from rubbing on the shoes. Those are available at Walgreens, um, uh, Rite Aid, all our local pharmacies uh, that uh, have this um, same similar stuff. Um, they use this, toe spacers uh, as well. Again, these are all to, meant to treat. Shoe modification, you go in and they actually, that's what they do to the shoe. They make a room for it um, um, to, uh, to accommodate the bunion. You can live and die with bunions. This is not heart disease. That's why I don't operate on a bunion unless it's killing you, it's causing you a lot of pain. If you come in the office and say, I don't like the way it looks, we're not doing surgery. Because bunion surgery can go bad. Then if it goes bad and you start having pain, then we're a lot worse. We can, in surgery, we can definitely give you pain. So if you come in the office without pain, we're not, we don't want to offer you something that will give you pain. So at least that's the way I think about it. Uh, there's multiple uh, shoe companies out there that are Marketing just for the bunion population. They're making high, high heel shoes. Um, Dance goes a very, very um, popular. Clark's. There's all ma mainstream shoe companies. Uh, they are. They're all marketing towards the bunion because it is. It is uh, ample in the population. What do we do? Um, well, like, like I said, the angle is important because if you come in with a bunion looking like this, I can't do a soft tissue procedure. I have to do a bone procedure to fix it. Uh, so, bigger thing is the physical findings, x-ray findings, the angles we measure, the age of the patient, how old is the patient, neurovascular status, if they're not a diabetic, they have good feeling in their feet, and the expectation. If you come in the office and you have x-rays like this and you tell me I want to get back into this high heel shoe that you bring with you, I can't do it. It's not possible. So, if you're expecting that from bunion surgery, you know, not, not a good surgical candidate. You're going to have problems and the relationship is gonna, not going to go well. So that's a huge one. That's the whole reason I put it in red is what do you, what's your expectation? I want to walk without pain? Great. We can do something for you. I want to uh, run without pain or I want to get back to my activities without pain. So versus I want to do, I want to wear these shoes. Or I want to do, you know, things that I, with this kind of bunnies, I cannot do. And I would be lying if I said I could. So it uh, depends on the degree of deformity. Mild is less than 20 of the hallux valus angle, the angle between one and two. Uh, I am angles between these two, so these are the different uh, numbers, just for reference. Uh, so what do we do? We do distal procedures, so if it's a mild bunion, I can fix it up here, distally, which means 
the more distal we go, the less uh, non-weight bearing we need. So less crutches we need, less, less time on crutches we need. The more proximal we go, the more inside, uh, uh, the base we go, the more uh, crutches and it makes the recovery longer. So we can do distal procedure, we can do mid-shaft procedure, we can do uh, a proximal procedure, which is here. Combination soft tissue and bone, fusion, as you see here, we can fuse it. If it's severe enough, if it's that bad, I mean, that's, that's almost 60 degrees. There's no way I can bring that back and put it in a normal position. So we just bring it back and we fuse it. <coughs> because our soft tissue have memories. So if, I, if you're like this for years, and I come in within two hours surgery, and I bring you back without fusing the joint, within, within a couple of weeks or two to six weeks, it's going to go back. It's not going to stay. And that's when I fuse the joint. Um, but one thing I'd like to point out is we have about 20 procedures for bunions. It's because we have not found one that works the best. So the most important thing in a bunion surgery is the degree of uh, um, deformity, <coughs> the surgeon experience, and where the surgeon trained. So what's best in my hand might not be best in the surgeon next to me's hand. I train more in an uh, orthopedic environment where we believe fusion stabilizes what's unstable. So we go in the midfoot and we fuse these joints. They're not supposed to move. So if they're moving, that's abnormal. We fuse those joints. But that is means that, that means six to eight weeks on crutches. <coughs> recovery uh, varies based on the type of procedure. So this is what I usually do. It's called a lapidus procedure. The hypermobile first way that I showed you earlier, I stop it from being hypermobile. I make it equal to one and two, and they work in unison. This is called a scarf procedure. We cut the mid shaft of the bone, swing it on, its, on itself, and screw it in two places. And that's bunion. So we have a bunion that's, so the bunion that's, it's, the, well, it's a better known as the Taylor's bunion. It's on the upper, opposite side of the foot. And it, it's from the position of the Taylor sits. They usually sit like this. So uh, there's a, it's similar, similar to the bunion. However, it's in opposite direction. So the bunion goes, Medial and uh, the metatarsal goes medial, the toe goes lateral. This one, the metatarsal goes lateral and the toe goes medial. So opposite. <clears throat> There's three types based on the anatomy. Uh, this is the fifth toe. I'm sorry, the fifth metatarsal. So you have either a bone that goes, that, that uh, turns obliquely lateral, a lateral bowing of the head. That's a type two. Type one is you just have a large fifth metatarsal head. This, the head of the bone is large, and type four, and type three is a widening of this angle, similar to what's the bunion on this side. So between uh, four and five, uh, wide angle. So one is the easiest to fix is because large, large head. All we do is shave that head, and we're done. If you have a bowing, we have to uh, turn that bowing inside. If you have a wide angle, we have to squeeze that. So those are bigger surgeries. What do they complain of? Pain and irritation caused by Friction uh, on the shoe. Uh, they usually also have a large uh, a callus at the bottom uh, of the foot from rubbing on the shoe. Uh, uh, that's what they complain of. The treatment modification of shoe wear, orthotics, to offload that fifth head. So I, I give you an orthotics and I create a divot to offload that area and stretching of the Achilles tendon. Surgical treatment is we cut the bone, shift it. Again, structural deformity, we, we turn it around. Uh, hallux rigidus, arthritis of the big toe, it's another one that's called a bunion. Uh, it's similar, you do get a, a bump on the first MTP, but it's usually on top versus the bunions on the side. Uh, complain uh, uh, of pain the same way with uh, uh, toe off or pushing off. Uh, usually it's caused by trauma. A lot of us uh, stub our toes, you know, all throughout the years, can't remember when and how, you know, you think about it a couple of days and then it goes away by itself. What happens is we nudge a piece of cartilage off, it's a small joint. Um, the definition of arthritis is the loss of articular cartilage. When you lose the cartilage around the bone, at the end of the bone, that's when you get arthritis. Same thing in the knee and the hip. So you get that in the big toe as well. Uh, so the body, what the body does when, when you have arthritis is it's trying to prevent that joint from moving. It hurts. I don't want that joint to move. So what it does, it lays down bone, lays down a big spur, stops that joint from moving. So anytime you try to push off somebody who likes to run, running when they're towing off, going up the stairs, they don't have that motion. They don't have that 10 degree motion they need to clear the ground, to up and move up. 
So <clears throat> pain, swelling, synovitis, restricted motion, you get a big spur on top of the bone. So imagine this toe trying to move up when, you, when you're walking and it hits, it's a door stop. Boom, boom, that's what's painful. So, and usually it's not common with bunion. You don't have both. If you're lucky enough to have both, you're one of the minority. It's usually one. So what do we do? Treatment is, uh, 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 depending on the, on, the, on the grade of disease, anti-inflammatories like we do in the knee, give you Celebrex, anti-inflammatories, injection, orthotics, uh, supportive shoe, taping, <coughs> physical therapy. Uh, none of that stuff will take the arthritis away, just like in the knee. None of that stuff will take in the hip. does not take it away. It just makes it bearable. You can live and die with arthritis. It's not a heart disease. It's not going to kill you, but it does hurt. So if you can't do what you want, then you're, you're unhappy, and then you come see us. So the way we treat this is a couple of things. We do chylectomy, meaning a lip removal. We just go in, and we knock that spur out, give that more room, cut, cut, give it room. 10 minute surgery, no, not a lot of recovery. You walk right away, no crutches are needed. Two weeks until the incision heals. Fusion, if, if the arthritis is severe enough, you have no joint space at all, we fuse the, ankle, we fuse the uh, uh, first metatarsal, two screws across. So now what happens is it's, it is gonna alter your, your gait a little bit. It's gonna make this joint, the one, the big toe joint, the center of the toe off. So when you go to move up, that's, that's not gonna move this is going to move. So you can't fuse both of them, but you can fuse one of them. But again, if you're having enough pain, I always try with the chylectomy. Not a lot of, you know, not a lot of uh, uh, loss there. You lose a little bit of the spur, not a lot of recovery. You keep the joint, uh, uh, not fuse it. That's, I always try with that. Arthroplasty, we have made um, some uh, uh, metal implants. They don't work as well. They get loose, and we usually end up taking them out. So that's our last topic is the adult flat foot. So that's different than the flexible flat foot you see in a kid, somebody who was born with flat feet. This is the person that had arches and over the years lost their arch or lost their, or lost their arch. So, uh, and that's due to a tendon dysfunction. It's called the posterior tibial tendon. It lives in the inside of the ankle, one of the biggest tendons. And that's what uh, helps the Achilles tendon uh, propel us forward as well. It works against the Achilles. So a tight Achilles makes the job of the posterior tibial tendon twice as hard. Um, uh, it's, it, it's, uh, what it does, it, it slows down eversion. When we go to put our heel down, we're in inversion, I'm sorry, eversion. That absorbs the shock. When we get to flat foot, uh, it's a neutral subtalar joint. But what I mean by the subtalar joint is that joint I, between the uh, talus and the calcaneus. So when we hit the ground, it's an inversion. The posterior so posterior tibial tendon slows it down. When we're in flat foot, it makes it neutral. When we go to toe off, it makes it inversion. So it pulls the foot that way, and that's that gives us the lever to push forward. So the tendon, the posterior tibial tendon and the Achilles are working on every step. And the people that have the iPhone app that shows how many steps you take per day, multiply that within 60 years of life or whatever you know, year. So it's working every day over and over and over and over. The same thing with that with the Achilles, it has a small amount of excursion. It only moves a little bit, two centimeters. Uh, it, um, uh, it has a, a zone of uh, uh, blood, um, uh, blood supply that called uh, uh, the uh, uh, bloodshed area. It does not get good blood supply. And it's usually around the back of the heel right here. I mean, inside, sorry, not the back of the heel, the inside of the uh, ankle. It inserts on the navicular. Again, it's, it's, a, it's a degenerative tendon. It's, it's big, it's uh, not working, it's white. Um, they do tear. Uh, by the time they tear, your foot is flat. So there's three stages of the disease, tendonitis, tendonitis uh, with flat foot, flat foot that is rigid. So, um, uh, so what a flat foot is, I stand you up when you come to the office, I stand you up, I look at you in the back. So this is a flat foot, the normal heel if you look at see yourself in the back, uh, in the, from the back, you should have a neutral hind, neutral foot, hind foot, or maybe about four degrees of valgus out to, away from the body. This is more than four degrees. That's a flat foot. So if you look at your foot, we call this the too many toes sign. So if I'm looking at you in the back and I see three, uh, three, four, and five of your toes, you have a flat foot. That's called the too many toes sign. This is a severe flat foot. So. Why do we care about flat foot? Is because if your foot is not underneath your ankle, imagine how much the tendon has to work harder to propel you forward. It's because it doesn't have a good lever arm. This is the lever arm. 
This is the lever arm of the Achilles tendon. So if it's sitting over here, not underneath the ankle. So the talus is, can't go anywhere. The talus is locked. It's locked in the ankle joint. It cannot go anywhere. So what happens is the foot goes that way. It goes out from underneath the ankle. And then it's not a good lever arm. <clears throat> Four stages. Uh, the first stage is you don't have a flat foot. You just have pain on the inside of the ankle, right over that tendon. Second stage, you have a flexible flat foot. Third stage, flexible uh, the flexible flat foot becomes a rigid flat foot. And stage four, you get the ankle involvement. Why do we care about the stages? It's because of the treatment. Um, pain, and, uh, they complain of pain on the inside of the ankles, swelling. The full alignment is normal in stage one. Able to do a single uh, toe rise. So I tell you, can you go up on your tippy toes? If you can, your ankle, I look at your heel. Your, your heel should invert. It goes in. That's in working Achilles tendon, you have tendonitis. So we treat you with anti-inflammatories. Stage two, you come in, I see too many toes sign. Go up on your, tip, uh, on your tippy toes. If you can do it, that means you're still flexible. The, the, the arch is still working. It's the tendon, is, the tendon is, is not working, but the arch is still working if you use other muscles to pull it up. <clears throat> Stage three, you get uh, pain. Uh, uh, that now now the, four, the flat foot is rigid. So what happens is the fibula, even though the tendons on the inside of the ankle, the pain is on the outside now. It's because the fibula, the, the small bone we have on the outside, is hitting on the heel bone. That's how flat the foot became that it kind of came out from underneath the ankle. Now this bone, so you lost all that distance, this bone is hitting on this bone. So that's painful. They come in complaining of outside pain, not inside pain because the tendon has long been gone. It's been degenerated. It doesn't work. It hasn't worked in years when they get to that stage. And then number four is when you get the ankle. So after years of flat foot underneath the ankle, the ankle ligaments give away, um, especially these ankle ligaments right here. They give away and you have valgus or outside ankle arthritis. So what do we do? We try orthotics. We try more of a bracing and then surgery. We have combination uh, of four procedure uh, that I do for flat foot reconstruction uh, uh, to create the arch. So uh, in order to have that surgery, you have to have a flexible flat foot. If you don't have a flexible flat foot, we can't recreate the arch. Uh, and this is a true patient, so we look at the head of the talus right here. The navicular is supposed to be sitting right on it, so it's supposed to be going from here to here. So we can see that the navicular has shifted off, so the foot had went that way. It went this way off the talus. So if you look at this one, he has a flat foot on that side, but it's not as bad. The talus is mildly covered. Here is more than 50% of the talus. This is the talus not covered. So what we do is we cut the, the heel bone in two places. We put a graft some screws and we shift the foot from this way, we bring it around. So we make it swing around. Big surgery, eight weeks in a cast, and you'll have three screws in your foot. So look at the, the, the comparison between a flat foot, flat, versus up, arch. Uh, if you have a stiff flat foot that doesn't move, I cannot recreate the arch, then what we do is we fuse the joints. There's the three joints we fuse, it's called a triple orthodesis. We, we put the foot in the right position and we fuse the hind foot. Um, and that's it. Uh, st stage four is uh, we do multiple procedures for it, but by the time that's, that's a big, big surgery that we can talk about if you have that. So um, again, I work at Sherlock Orthopedics. Uh, thank you for your attention and I appreciate your time. Mm -hmm.